Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. In few of the hours, I tend to speak uh, very long, but then I will start just with my conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> if we have time, then I can, I can go back. <laughs> If we don't have time, then we can move on. So, my conclusion is, first, pro the prospect for Indonesia and ASEAN to cooperate with other countries in preventing and promoting, promoting maritime security in the Asia-Pacific region is very possible. And I don't exclude that uh, possibility uh, at all. But it should be based on common and converging interest. And if we cannot find common and converging interest, then not easy to find area for cooperation. Now, in that case, for Indonesia, for instance, the issue of cooperation very largely depend on the need to maintain Indonesian national unity as an archipelagic country which is subject to all kind of foreign navigations that may and may not interfere sometime with the issue of domestic stability and domestic unity uh, and so forth. Uh, Indonesia is very careful of that one. As long as it does not pose any problem to that, they are very open to cooperation in other areas, like in eliminating piracy, eliminating illegal fishing, all kinds of uh, threat by terrorism, and, and so forth. Very open to all kind of cooperation on the issues. But when it comes to supporting regionalism, regional movement, or regional quote, separation and so forth, uh, Indonesia is very careful in developing uh, cooperation on that one. The second conclusion that I have is Indonesia and ASEAN and its partners have common interests in seeing the development of a viable and prosperous Indonesia, ASEAN, and all countries in the South China Sea area. Uh, this is an area where cooperation could be developed, including in maritime issues. And I would say that the next coming government in Indonesia that will start on the 20th of this month have already said on a number of occasions that maritime issue will be one of the priorities of the government. And this is opening up possibility for all kind of cooperations with the outsiders as well as with other ASEAN countries. My third conclusion is, to some extent, the national integrity, stability, and law and order in Indonesia and its maritime zone, as well as in ASEAN area, depend on the viability and ability of the Indonesian defense and law enforcement forces. Therefore, when we talk about the need for law and order, in Indonesia and Southeast Asia, you cannot avoid the possibility of increasing your maritime capacity. Uh, sometimes it is looked upon suspiciously by others. But if you look into a very large body of waters in Indonesia, where two-thirds of Indonesia consist of waters, the building up of forces, either military or police or law enforcement, is so essential. Now, at this moment, for instance, Indonesia is still struggling with how
to realize what they call the minimum essential force. A country like Indonesia so far never spent a budget for defense more than 1% of your GDP. A very small percentage. And in some cases, if you look into the budget spent by Indonesia, it's much smaller than the budget spent by the neighboring countries in terms of dollar amount and, and so forth. While the area that they have to defend, uh, the area they have to maintain law and order are uh, very uh, great, uh, very big. And at the same time, their position also is becoming much more difficult to protect. Because we talk a lot today about the South China Sea. And we talk a lot today also about the Indian Ocean. And between the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, that lies Indonesia. What happen, happened in the Indian Ocean will affect Indonesia. What have happened in the South China Sea will affect Indonesia. That is one of the reasons why 20 years ago, with the support of Canada, we look into the possibility, how do we see so that that situation will not negatively affect uh, Indonesian peace, stability, development, and, and so forth. People are saying to us, we have nothing to do with the South China Sea. Yes, when it comes to territorial problems, but if something happening there, now I remember a lesson that I learned in school uh, some 50 years ago, that when your neighbor's house is on fire, you can never feel safe. So when the South China Sea is on fire, also it's outside of Indonesia, Indonesia will never feel safe because of its location there and very close to the uh, Indian Ocean, <coughs> Pacific Ocean, and South China Sea and so on. And that is why we like to have uh, some kind of uh, cooperative kind of relationship with all our neighbors and so forth. The second, the, the next one is my first conclusion is that uh, in the question that were put to me, will ASEAN be divided in facing this kind of situation? In a way, it will have different opinions. We see that kind of different opinion already. Uh, but in the end, I believe it will not break up ASEAN. And I like to make an assurance on that one from my point of view. I find sometimes that uh, even in a family, you can have quarrel. In ASEAN, we don't have quarrel. We only have a different opinion. And therefore, it's not enough good to think of a splitting of ASEAN because of this kind of situation. We may have a different way of dealing with this issue. Uh, some of us, like in your uh, paper or question is, like to depend on others. Some of us like to depend on all of us. Some of us like to depend on just ourselves. Now, and this kind of perception of different uh, outlook, I don't think Indonesia and ASEAN uh, have any kind of splitting kind of atmosphere. So I should emphasize to you that uh, whatever different policy that we have with other countries and so forth, we are not going to be uh, disparate to, to be in this area. Now, in this particular case, I should probably mention, in all dealing with the outsiders, ASEAN is always emphasizing one point, two point, three point. One point is we should consider the centrality of ASEAN. That is opposition of the ASEAN that has to be maintained by all uh, ASEAN countries. The second one is we have to play what we call a dynamic equilibrium kind of policy. That we are not longer taking side in all this kind of dispute, but we take whatever is useful for us, for all of us including for the non-ASEAN countries and so forth. That is why Indonesia, ASEAN, maintain as much as possible close relationship with all the countries around us, around ASEAN countries, 
particularly Australia, good relation, India, very good relation, Japan, very good relation, even with the United States and Canada and so forth, we have maintained a very good uh, kind of uh, relationship. There is a problem, though, that we still continue to do. That is maritime boundary delimitation. Among ASEAN countries, there is very little issue of territorial dispute as such, except one or two. Like, uh, I don't want to mention it, but you may ask me what. The one and two is the Philippines and Malaysia. That kind of issue is, it's been there for ages, and we don't want to deal with it. We just let it, Malaysia and the Philippines, deal with it. But Territorial issues is for the country's concern to settle, but the consequences of it is for us to deal with. Now, all this kind of thing, all that we do is encourage all ASEAN countries to settle whatever boundaries, delimitation, maritime issues, and not, they should do it. And Indonesia is very conscious about it, and perhaps difficult to find countries in the world where Indonesia so far had written agreement, 21 agreement on maritime boundaries with all its neighbors. The recent one was the Philippines or the economic zone boundary in the Celebes Sea and in the Pacific Ocean. The last one was with Singapore in the eastern part of the Strait of Singapore. We still have to deal with Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia how to join the Indonesian-Malaysian boundary in the Strait of Malacca with Indonesian-Singapore boundary in the Strait of Singapore. There is still a big hole there that we have not yet been done. But this, we continue to talk and to do about it, and hopefully we can settle it also as soon as possible. This is not going to be easy. And some people are taking this as a matter of impossible thing and become despair. I remember talking to the Philippines 40 years ago, making discussion on this. And only after 40 years of talking, we finally reached agreement. China and Vietnam take more than 50 years of reaching agreement in the Gulf of Tonkin. Ah, maybe you, Canada, are lucky not to have this kind of uh, situation, but we in Southeast Asia have so many boundaries with us that we have to deal with it with a very, very great deal of patience and very uh, great deal of seriousness uh, and so forth. Uh, I, I like to come to this, but somewhat later, on this issue of Canada, because I'm very much interested also in following whether you have a problem or not in the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> Sometimes I think, and no one answered to me, maybe you should answer it to me. Do you consider Arctic Ocean as semi enclosed also or not? Because it is generally surrounded by economic zone of the coastal countries. And do you consider Arctic Ocean as the next problem after South China Sea. <laughs> but I don't want to touch on that one, but uh, maybe there will be occasion for us to uh, discuss that at a later stage. Now, this, this country, in my mind, is that uh, we hope to have been able to do uh, something with regard to the South China Sea so forth. My next conclusion is some of the region in our area have not really taken into consideration and perhaps lessons learned of what we have done in the South China Sea. For instance, we have mechanism of ASEAN in the South China Sea that deal with China with regard to declaration of conduct, code of conduct, and so things like that. But there is no such mechanism exist in East China Sea. I don't see any mechanism like that also in the Japan Sea or in other seas around the Pacific Ocean. While the situation there, just as heated up 
as compared to the other part of the world. Now, I keep wondering whether South China Sea cooperative mechanism that we have been trying to do, that I mentioned today, could be also employed or work out in other part of the seas in uh, the Pacific Ocean. We work together, for instance, with Philippines, Singapore, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia on the Sulu Sea on a cooperative program against terrorism, cooperative program against all kinds of things. We have all kinds of management there. But in other parts of the world, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, I don't see that uh, much happening. Now, my uh, next point is that uh, I also hope that the spirit of cooperation among the ASEAN countries could be developed also in other areas. I know that sometimes East China Sea trying to develop a certain kind of conduct or declaration of conduct or something. I really hope that they can do it. Also, now it may not be very possible to look at it. But if we can do it in Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, in South China Sea, I think we can, they can do that also. One of the lessons that is more important for this one which is also now being, should be employed in the Indian Ocean, we take the all-inclusive approach. This is the, the important lessons. When dealing with this issue, you should not only talk to those who agree with you, but you should also talk with those who disagree with you. And this is a very difficult lesson. For instance, in the South China Sea, in the very beginning of the process, the issue of how do you involve Taiwan in it. A lot of debate took place because Taiwan is not a state as such from some point of view. But they are occupying Ituaba as we can see in the map today. Uh, therefore, we find out a way how to deal with them. And therefore, we don't call them Taiwan. We call them Chinese Taipei. Why we call Chinese Taipei? Because that's the name accepted in APEC. And they are a member of APEC. And as such, they can become member as Chinese Taipei in the workshop process that we organize already with your help at the beginning, with the Canadian help. And for that matter, up to now, they have been very uh, constructive and Chinese Taipei and China in the workshop process have been uh, very uh, supportive and very cooperative and that's why we can move quite a lot on some of the technical matters and so forth. My uh, last point is, I don't know how long I can have the time, uh, in few of the time, but let just me uh, conclude this by saying that this is a very big idea and I would be very delighted if this conference, Jim, could sort of agree with me on this one. <laughs> that is, if in the past, the slogan on Maritime Affairs was, those who rules the wave, rules the world. I would like to replace it now by saying, those who cooperate on maritime issues will benefit themselves, will benefit mankind, and will save the world. If they don't have that kind of slogan, we may see problem all the time. We may see conflict. But by emphasizing cooperation, as we try to do very hard, as ASEAN trying to do very hard, not only in Southeast Asia, but with the rest of the world, by inviting others, like in the ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus 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 plus, and then bringing everyone to cooperate, not to compete or not to command the others what to do. Hopefully, this kind of things may also be the idea that will come out from this kind of discussion emphasizing cooperation 
the confrontation. Emphasizing, emphasizing common benefit rather than particular interest. And if we can do that, I think this meeting has done substantially very, very important thing for the Asia-Pacific maritime security. I thank you very much.